thank you very much everybody um so um everything we do in carbon neutral cambridge is driven by the interests and enthusiasms of us we're all volunteers um nobody's paid to do anything um and so i thought it might be nice if we just started um might i ask the um the committee members to um just say a few words i mean 10 seconds each on who you are um and um yeah, so um, um, James. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so my name is James Smith. I'm a, a GP and public health doctor and I teach at the University of Cambridge. I also do a little bit of research there. Um, and I'm also a GP uh, in central Cambridge. Okay, uh, Hilary. So I'm, I'm Hilary Seward. I'm a treasurer and an accountant specializing in charity accounts. And I'm also recently retraining as a complementary therapist. And Richard. I'm Richard Townley. I live in Fullbourne. I'm a retired town and country planner and I'm involved in environmental groups in the village and around and also with Cambridge Past, Present and Future. Thank you, Richard. And Isabella. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Isabella Butner. I am a senior researcher at the University College of London. Um, working pretty much with the carbonization pathways to net zero. So strong interest in carbon neutral. Thank you. And Claire? Yeah, hi, I'm Claire, based in Barrington. Um, I am heavily involved in local groups um, and run my own eco group here in Barrington. I've been doing that uh, in other areas in Britain as well. And now I'm also a therapist um, and recently took part in the, well, ran the, um, that made the film from the ground up for CNC. Great. Thank you very much. And I'm Anne, I'm, I'm chair of um, CNC. I was originally an, enge an engineer. Um, I then did a lot of stuff on um, running a business uh, with, to do with organizational development, innovation and creativity. And I now spend the, virtually all my time on, on low carbon um, stuff in, in various, various ways. Um, so, um, on our website, um, you can see our annual report. Um, um, James, would you be able to file share that while I'm just going through and things? Do, do you know how to do that? Uh, I'll work it out, I'll yeah. try. Yeah. yeah, just file, so you can just put it in chat and click on the three buttons on the right and you can upload the, the, the annual report and accounts. And then anybody who hasn't yet managed to download it and wishes to have it can just download it by clicking on the things that James is going to upload. So um, it's been a, another weird year, thanks to COVID. Um, so I thought that um, I would start just by showing, highlighting um, two key projects that um, CNC people have been involved in. Um, and um, so I'm going to start um, by um, um, screen sharing um, some, some work we did on analyzing the entire energy performance certificate data set um, for um, the combined authority region. And this was done by, um, by, by Max um, Rockersack um, and with um, David Earl um, um, created some wonderful heat maps for it online. So if I share my screen um, on the website, um, you can see um, on, on the resources section of the page, um, um, it's available here. We go to here and we have um, created the energy performance certificates in two different ways. One, we plotted it as a sort of heat map, and the other we arranged to, to show more detailed EPC data. So for example, if you want to scroll down um, and see, and we, particular, we were particularly interested to see where are the real low hanging fruit. For example, ho homes that have very poorly insulated roofs, which are very often cheap to fix, or uninsulated cavity walls. So if I just look at Cambridge City, roof insulation heat map, and um, what we see here um, is the whole of Cambridge. And if we zoom in, you can start to see hot spots. And just for the sake of argument, um, I'm just going to look and zoom in to here on the corner of Long Road and Trumpington Road um, in Trumpington. There's a very weird hot spot there. And you might get curious and wonder what was that, what was that about? So you can then go back here and look on the roof insulation postcode map and this shows the number of houses and their sort of average EPCs. Um, 
and you go here and it's this block here where there's 21 flats that are very poor and you can see that they're very typically EPC E which is pretty dreadful um, it could be upgraded to D it's got very poor roof energy which it's probably got it's assumed to have, to have no insulation the walls are very poor and it was constructed in 1950-1966 and you can scroll through all the flats there we do actually have full data including the individual address addresses um, I'm just going to stop stop doing that we, so we, we do actually have full data um, on all the homes, but for the purposes of preserving the privacy of the people who live there, we, we aren't, aren't disclosing that, we aren't putting it on the map. So this has been used by quite a lot of groups, including South Cams, um, have emailed lots of parishes saying, you know, you know, explore your areas, where there's areas where you know there's poor insulation, see what you can do to help. And the second big project was a wonderful project led by Claire, um, in which we made a, um, a film um, interviewing various local farmers on what they were doing um, about sustainable agriculture. And I thought we might just play a short extract um, of that film, or rather of one of the um, mini films we made uh, together with that. And you can see all these on our YouTube channel. So if I can share this film with that. Um, it's about two and a half minutes. beaver away turning the vegetation that sits on the top of the field after harvest and turning it into nutrition for us munching it up consuming it and then we've got some of the larger worms and there's an example there that are the deep burrowing ones and they make these lovely holes drainage holes in the soil which means that rainfall percolates away really easily and really quickly and it means that the conservation no-till farming style of farming is very resilient to the weather and it means the opportunities to plant when you want to plant are much greater as well as the cost savings. The impressive thing about the root structure in, in these cover crops and you can see how far that's gone down is it's gone down like that in a soil that's very friable, it's got a nice open pore structure, there's been no compaction it hasn't run together in a period of high rainfall like some soils can and you can see there's been absolutely no impedance to how that plant grows and as i said this soil hasn't been tilled and disturbed any deeper than an inch and a half two inches deep for five six years now and it proves that actually you don't need to plow you don't need to till to create the environment for plants to root freely in you have to do a comparison and you can instantly see that with the high rainfall that we've had and this is a, a barley crop that's been planted that the soil surface has run together and it's sort of lost its structure and so now if we get quite a high rainfall again because the top is sealed because there's no um, root structure from the cover crop and much less organic matter that the rain isn't going to percolate into this soil very quickly and anywhere there's a slight slope it will start to run off so any herbicide or nutrition that's been applied to the surface is at risk of running into the into the water courses when you go to dig although it's been plowed and tilled and cultivated and in theory should have a loose structure to plant the next crop into you can see how solid this is and how the rainfall that we've had has run this together and effectively sealed it and next door in the cover crop where every handful had an abundance of worms and fibrous roots and worm holes and open pores of course this land that's been that's been tilled is almost solid and when that dries out it will effectively turn into a house brick because it's very solid and there's there's no natural structure So I um, do go onto the resources page of our website or our YouTube channel and you can find the links to those films. I find them really powerful. We were thrilled that, he, that they, they've, they've had about three, four thousand views, um, and including the head of Future Farming at DEFRA um, was complimenting um, the film and saying people should watch it. Um, and it really just shows there's lots of really inspiring things that can be done. Um, to save carbon, to accelerate the transition, um, whether that's in um, energy performance standards in domestic homes, 
um, or in agriculture or in other areas. Um, much of it's easy to do, some of it's already being done, but we need to do all of it right now and get on with it. So um, are there any quick questions? Um, I should say, if you want to have questions, um, put them in chat or comments, put them in chat and James will filter out any that are actually questions um, and ask you to ask them. Um, so before we go and look at the accounts, are there any questions, uh, James? No, just people sharing links and things, which is good, but I haven't seen any questions. Great, brilliant. So yeah, do 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 share links to things that you think are useful, and we will be aiming to make this um, available um, online um, um, after after the event. So, um, Hillary, um, would you like to um, share the accounts? So just discuss the accounts. I will very briefly share um, what we have. Um, um, how am I screen sharing it? Yes, I think I'm screen sharing it. Um, sorry, there we are. Um, so Hilary, would you like to speak to the council? Then if anybody's got any questions, um, Hilary can answer them and then um, we will take a little poll to approve the accounts. Okay, um, I think this is probably going to be the quickest presentation of any accounts because there really is not an awful lot for me to say. Um, as you can see, we had, uh, again, small amounts of money coming in, grants and donations, and made a small surplus for the year, the expenses being on the film, um, and that we have reserves at the end of the year, increasing slightly to just over 4,000. Um, so we have money in the bank to be able to do more projects this year uh, to keep going with all this magnificent work. Um, and I really can't think of anything more to say, but if anybody's got any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. And I just um, request that you approve them. Okay, does, does anybody have any questions? No questions? Okay, um, then I'm going to put up a little poll um, and um, to, to ask if whether you approve the report on accounts, which our constitution requires us to do. Some of you are formal members of Carbon Neutral Cambridge, some of you aren't, but we will, but anybody, everybody's welcome to vote. And if it comes to it, we'll filter out later um, who, who of the people who voted. Um, our members and who aren't. If, if you'd like to become a member, um, you can do so on the join us page of our website. Okay, um, so if I launch the poll. So hopefully you're now seeing the poll. Um, do um, indicate your answers and when we've had a reasonable number of people, I will close the poll and reveal the results. Okay, we've had 80% participated, 84% 80, participated. Any last ones? Okay, I'll end the poll and share the results. So are you seeing the results? Yeah, good, okay. Um, and um, so I think um, we can say that the um, accounts have been approved, NEMCON. Okay, thank you very much, Hilary. Uh, Um, so um, just uh, briefly about our future plans. Um, um, as I say, everything we do is driven by um, the enthusiasms of those of us um, who are our members. Um, and so it really depends what makes our fancy. But I think one of the key priorities for the forthcoming immediate period is going to be the local plan. There were some elements, elements of it that look really excellent. Um, so the proposed low carbon building standards um, for new homes um, in the plan look really excellent. Um, on the other hand, the shortage of water means that I gather that even the lowest possible number of new homes um, is barely sustainable um, and they've gone for considerably more than that. So th there's real questions about the sustainability um, of the number of homes. So anyhow, we will be continuing to engage with that. And we quite like working with unusual partners, trying to address the elephant in the room, trying to find constructive way forwards on difficult questions. So we may be working with some um, sort of unusual suspects um, to, to, to try to advance the agenda so that we get the best possible um, planning um, 
local, local plan um, for the future. In general, we, we like to um, address the challenge of, of greenwash um, and trying to be creative, helping look for solutions and supportive of those doing the right things while challenging um, those, those who aren't. Um, so if you have any ideas or um, suggestions, um, do put them in chat. Um, um, if there's any key questions, um, James will call on you. I'm trying to move forward through this quite quickly so we can hear from Ahmed, which I think we're all very interested to do. Um, so are you seeing any questions, James? No. Good. Um, and um, um, as I say, do put suggestions in chat and we'll look at them afterwards and, and, and get in touch. Um, the CNC is driven by, um, is, is steered by its committee. Um, and um, we have no need to have formal elections this year because we did the elections last year. Um, but we, we are quite interested to recruit um, one or two more committee members just to help keep things fresh, to add expertise. So if any of you present um, might be interested, um, do um, give us a call um, or send us an email to info at carbonneutralcambridge.org. Um, and we're really happy to chat. Um, so um, without, um, Further ado, um, unless uh, any last questions? Okay, um, I will close the formal bit of the meeting and we will move on to um, hearing from Alid. Um, so I was very pleased that Alid was able to um, um, give, 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 share, share his views um, on this, this, sort of, this sort of difficult and important time. Um, um, Alid is uh, director of the Global Sustainability Institute at Anglo Ruskin University um, and I'm extremely knowledgeable on the um, political and financial um, situation. Um, he's also involved in the Climate Committee for Essex. Um, so I, I'm fascinated to hear his, his insights and I'm sure he will be uh, speaking very frankly to us. Um, as I perhaps should have mentioned earlier, um, we are recording um, this event, so I'm planning to put it um, online um, afterwards. If any of you um, don't want to be um, shown um, on that, um, let me know and we'll do something about it. Okay, so Alid, um, over to you. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I think Anne sort of asked me to just present my current thoughts. And I'm happy to um, answer any questions or uh, get into discussion. So I'll try and leave um, a good time for discussion as well. And uh, I mean, I know a lot of you are involved in uh, climate change in various different ways. So it'd be good to hear from you as well about your thoughts on where we are at the moment. As Anne said, I'd sit on the Essex Climate uh, Action Commission and um, recently as well on the Innovation and Business Subcommittee for the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Climate Commission as well, uh, and that should be reporting around uh, innovation and business in the next month or so. Uh, and the Essex Climate Commission did its first report uh, a few months ago. Um, so I'm not really going to be talking about the sort of the regional political landscape on that, um, other than to say that there's a lot going on through those commissions trying to advise uh, or put in place some recommendations both to the combined authority and to Essex County Council, but also to local businesses and um, householders uh, in a sort of, you know, how do we move these regions forward towards net zero and what's needed uh, in the landscape and the infrastructure to enable that change to happen. Um, uh, there's obviously also COP happening uh, in uh, late November, so in about eight weeks time. Uh, in Glasgow, and there's a lot of focus around what the UK government can commit to and what it can get commitments to from other governments uh, between now and then. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an interesting political time around climate change and climate action, and, and also just thinking about what net zero means. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to share my screen, um, or whoever the host will have to let, uh, enable me to be able to share my screen. So if I can do that, uh, then I can share some slides. Um, and what I was going to try and do is just sort of reflect on what's happened over the last 10 years and what we need to do over the next 10 years. So as we agree to something in COP26, and hopefully it will be ambitious, 
but also as we already have net zero targets towards the end of this century, uh, towards the end of this um, 30 years. So 2050 is a sort of net zero target uh, date or 2045, depending on which country you're in. Uh, you know, this is this is 20 to 30 years out. So a lot has to change over the next 20 to 30 years. And in particular, lots has to change over the next 10 years. Um, so let me see if this works. So hopefully if you can see the slides. Yeah, that's fine, Alec. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so a, a sort of decade of expectations in 2021. So it's a really interesting time. Uh, we're just over 10 years from uh, Copenhagen when we thought climate change could be solved. Uh, and now we're, we've got Glasgow coming up. So you know where are we and, and what do we need to do um just a, a quick uh, sort of summary of where we currently are um there are more extreme weather events scientists are becoming much bolder in attributing particular events to climate change or at least saying we wouldn't expect to see this many extreme weather events happening all at the same time if it wasn't due to climate change uh, but also direct attributed um, attributing some particular weather events to climate change we've had you know record weather record temperatures in june we've had record um, uh, water record uh, droughts in all around the world over the last few years so our weather system has already changed and we're still allowing the planet to warm up by at least another 0.4 degrees before we're even talking about the stabilization that cop 26 is trying to manage um, potentially going up to two degrees and all of the contributions that governments are proposing to put in place for their emission reductions don't even get us to two degrees. So the sort of extreme weather we've already experienced, we should expect more of uh, and worse uh, over the next 30 years. And then I think if people have seen my presentations before, I sometimes use these uh, graphs. Uh, you've got the crude oil prices. So resource volatility has also been going up some of it's linked to climate change, some of it is just linked to geopolitics and the growth of China and economic de demand for things like oil. We've seen in the UK at the moment uh, a massive spike in gas prices, uh, partly down to the geopolitics between the EU and Russia, partly down to Brexit, uh, meaning we're no longer in the um, down advanced gas uh, auctions, uh, partly down to uh, increased demand partly down to us switching off nuclear power stations and various other things so there's lots of things that go into volatility around fossil fuel prices but the important thing to note is that fossil fuel prices will always be volatile they've been incredibly volatile over the last 10 years and will continue to be so over the next 30 years so planning any sort of policy in government that's reliant on continued low fossil fuel prices is uh it's not going to work so we need to do something different there and partly that's true because of the increased inequality that we've got in between countries and within countries. So as really wealthy people have got even wealthier, um, the poor people have stayed poor or only got slightly less poor. So this increased inequality means that increased volatility around energy and increased impacts from weather are really important to try and tackle. So all those things should come into COP, uh, but I'm not sure if they will. Um, and then this other thing is this sort of wave of innovation. I use this slide quite a bit, uh, just in terms of the different innovation cycles that we've seen. There's a contrary of waves of innovation, starting with the sort of industrial revolution, steam power, electricity, through to digital networks and IT and biotech that we've seen recently. But then um, even more recently, we are seeing a new green revolution happening. Um, and it's while it's starting to happen slowly, it's increasing in pace and it will increase exponentially over the next uh, decade or so. So we are in this new wave of global innovation. How we manage that and how we drive it forward uh, is really important. We could make inequality a lot worse. Um, so the one thing that's happened in all the other previous waves of innovation is people have got really wealthy. So you have oil barons, you have electricity barons, you have train barons who then build the infrastructure in towns and cities who then try and create society around some of that wealth. We could see a similar green barren revolution, or we could try and manage this slightly better so we don't just perpetuate that problem going forward. So there's some questions about how we do this 
transition as well um, as whether it's going to happen. Um, so it is going to happen. It's just a question of how quickly, how well managed it is. Obviously, the UK government has got a lot of different plans uh, for harnessing and capturing some of that industrial revolution so that the UK can benefit from it. This is the 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution from the UK government. The Treasury is also uh, doing a net zero review for all the policies, so a costed um, review of policies. Um, that net zero review is due out at the beginning of this year. Uh, and it's been delayed uh, and delayed. I don't expect it to come out before COP um, and all the rumours around why it's being delayed is because uh, the Treasury are very um, black and white in looking at purely the costs of the transition. So how do you fairly allocate the costs of the transition to make sure that it's not all on the energy poor, um, which is a really important thing to do. But if you don't think about any of the benefits uh, then only focusing on the costs means it will cost something. Whereas if you have benefits to also share out, uh, then you can offset some of those costs by thinking about returns on innovation, returns on industrial revolution. Um, and if you don't do that, then, then obviously any, any change to any economic activity will just look like a cost. So it's a sort of traditional um, treasury review, which unfortunately misses half of the story. Uh, and that's why it looks like it's being delayed, because basically it just says we shouldn't do this because it's going to cost us money. Um, but then, you know, looking at things like this industrial revolution, we were quite um, within the GSI thinking about actually where are we now uh, and going forward. And, and in particular, uh, you know, we've been inspired by the, uh, the children striking uh, and going out on demonstrations, um, but also the the narrative there is very doom we're not doing enough we're not doing anything at all about climate change uh, and we need to be doing a lot more and while it's absolutely true uh, we're certainly not doing enough and governments are not taking it seriously uh, we have actually done something um, and i think the important thing is if we were starting from nothing now we would never get there uh, and it's important to recognize that actually we aren't starting from a totally blank sheet of paper and the world is radically different today than it was 10 years ago so we've put together um, a set of letters from children this is an example of one of the letters from uh, emma who is 10 so the other thing about the gsi is um, we set it up 10 years ago uh, in february so it's our 10th anniversary this year so for our 10th anniversary we wrote out to lots of schools local schools and schools around the world uh, to ask their children who are about the same age as our institute, so children who are about 10, what they thought about climate change, and to write to their respective world leaders, uh, asking them what they wanted uh, to, to see happen and what they wanted to see that would be different. Um, so this is one of the uh, letters that was illustrated and was in our magazine, So What? We've taken those letters, almost 100 letters from the UK, India, US, Brazil, Hungary, Nigeria, Australia and Russia um, and taking those letters and reflected on those and used those uh, to, to put together a book um, and the book look, does two things one it looks back over the last 10 years so what has already changed in the lifetime of these children and also what needs to happen before they all start voting so what needs to happen in the next 10 years um, and it's a sort of we're sort of writing to the world leaders to say, these children, this is what's happened in their lifetime so far. And if you want them to vote for you, this is what you need to do. So we've produced a book um, called Dear World Leaders, which you can get on Amazon if you want. We have some copies. Uh, the Amazon one is less sustainable, but the copies we have, which we're sending out to local primary schools um, and, uh, and also to the world leaders is on 100% recycled on vegetable ink dye. So very sustainably printed. But uh, it's also illustrated by um, the undergraduate students at Anglia who are all around 20 years old. Uh, so they illustrated the book um, to try and bring some of their letters to life. But then, so just to sort of go through some of these issues very quickly, because I think it's, it's been, it's easy to say, you know, do, we're not doing enough and we need to raise $2 billion per year in energy uh, or $2, billion, uh, yeah, $2 trillion per year to solve climate change. Um, 
but I think it's important to also then reflect on what's happened. And so over the last 10 years of within energy, uh, we've invented a solar industry. We've invented a global wind industry. We've invented uh, a global tidal industry, which is a bit behind the other two, but these industries didn't really exist 10 years ago. So, you know, examples of those solar installations increased 175 times in India. There's twice as much global wind power and it's half as expensive and, and the cost curves for renewables is coming down dramatically. And we are already investing $500 billion every year into renewables. We should be investing $2 trillion a year into renewables, but it's not going from zero to two trillion. It's going from, it, it's, it's a factor of four increase. But it is a, it's a steep increase. And this plot from Medias, a European project, looking at the, the emissions trajectory that's needed. This is a plot from one of the worst uh, in terms of uh, changes that's needed in Europe. So this is Austria showing the emissions curve for Austria, uh, which is gently increasing. Uh, and then what it needs to do to meet its net zero target, which is to massively decrease absolutely everything over the next um, 30 to 40 years. So this tries to meet the European targets, or well, this does meet the European targets as they are currently in place. It allows for some uh, agriculture emissions left from 2050 onwards. Um, so it's not a net zero, but it's an 80% reduction by 2050. But that's a massive change in the energy system that's needed. So, you know, we've done something, but actually the scale of the change needed going forward is much bigger than what we've done over the last 10 years. Transport. Uh, what we've done over the last 10 years, again, we've invented a global electric vehicles industry, which is still at its infancy, but uh, it now employs uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, what we need to do in the next 10 years is accelerate that. We need every car to be electric. We need to also fly a lot less, which uh, people have been doing less of in the last 18 months, but we don't want to be doing it because there's a global pandemic still going on. And we need to use more public transport, cycle more, walk more. So we need a huge behavior change alongside inventing these industries, which are kind of easier to do than create the behavior changes. So we need to do the more difficult things around behavior. Forests. We have reduced by a third the rate of deforestation, but that's we've just slightly slowed down our destruction of the planet. We haven't stopped it. So we're continuing to deforest uh, at a really alarming rate. Uh, what we need to do is to stop deforestation and to plant a trillion trees. Um, so that's the sort of target we want to do. But it's possible to do in 2017, you know, there was a one and a half million volunteers who planted 66 million trees in 12 hours. Uh, don't know if they're still alive, those trees, but it, you know it's possible to radically change things and, and people do want to do this. So um, those sorts of targets, might sound daunting, but there's a lot of people in the world who can do a lot of good as well as a lot of bad. Um, on food, uh, this is quite an interesting one where a lot of this was really unexpected 10 years ago. So if you'd asked 20, 10 years ago what's happening with food and whether you could get large scale behavior change around food, most people would have said, no, that's, that's really difficult. But uh, the meat free industry and plant based diet industry in the UK and globally has emerged out of practically nothing. I mean, it was a niche market. It's now mainstream. You can get vegan sausage rolls at Greg's. I mean, this is, this is unprecedented in terms of um, a change in our diets. Uh, and this seems to be continuing uh, and uh, gathering uh, more and more pace. So over the next 10 years, we need to build on that. We all around the world need to eat less meat. Um, and we need to change the way we farm so that it's more sustainable. And actually here, it seems to be the behavior that might be easier to do than changing the way that we actually do the practical innovation in farming. Although there's a lot more innovation happening in farming currently, but a lot more focus needs to be put there. For homes, and you've just been talking about insulation uh, of homes, but um, from less than 1%, nearly half of our global sales in lighting are now LED. Uh, so that's a massive shift, again, in a, a brand new industry growing up and taking over the market. Um, and governments around the world have introduced incentives for homes to be better insulated and for renewable energy. 
uh, some of those incentives work, some of them don't. So we need to get better at knowing what works and what doesn't and what the real barriers are uh, and actually how to go to scale. So we need our homes to be net generators of energy, not net consumers of energy. Um, so that they're better insulated, they have their own uh, renewables. And there's no reason really why we can't do that over the next 10 years. We also need to obviously climate proof our homes and make sure they're built in areas that are climate resilient, uh, including areas that have plenty of water to supply the homes that are built in them, um, but also places that don't have too much water. So those homes are going to be flooded all the time. Uh, jobs as important as the sort of sectors, but there are now over 10 million people working in the renewables industry. Um, but we also need to think about how net zero impacts every job uh, in the world. So it's not just, you know, rooftop solar installers or insulation installers that will be working in the green space that will impact everything we do in some way. So while we will need to support a huge jobs growth in renewables, and we need to support people to move away from sectors that will close down like fossil fuels and the oil sector. So we need to be able to work with them to upskill and help train them. And you saw recent announcements from uh, a certain union in the UK saying that this was going to kill jobs and we should definitely not do anything about climate change. Uh, there's been a huge backlash against that because it's kind of maybe you won't be able to be a union for the oil sector anymore. And maybe that's OK if you, all your workers get a job somewhere else and join a different union then that's uh, fine. Um, but also it's investing in the wider green skills so that everyone understands their role in this transition. Um, in waste, uh, lots of places have now changed their waste practices uh, over the last 10 years in particular. So plastic bags have been the sort of iconic um, emblem of changes to uh, waste. So 74 countries have banned plastic bags altogether, including Nigeria. Uh, in the UK, we've put a plastic bag tax. And this is just the, the rapid change once you focus on an issue that's happened. So this is after Wales and then Northern Ireland introduced the 5p charge on plastic bags. You can see it, you know, it dropped within a year by 80% usage. Uh, they're slowly creeping up Again, but they're still at really historic lows, although in the last year, obviously, with COVID, then plastic bag usage and plastic usage has shot back up. So when we come out of COVID, hopefully we'll go back to using a lot less plastic. But essentially, we need to stop putting lots of plastic waste in the ocean and we need to think about a circular economy, how we reuse, recycle um, things, whether they're in healthcare or in infrastructure. Um, and in... The last 10 years around behaviour, which is often the more difficult one to, to do, uh, but people are understanding what a carbon footprint is, and some people are managing their behaviour to reduce it, maybe not by a lot, um, but there are increasing initiatives uh, around carbon footprint management uh, and, and taking that forward. And interestingly, the media has sort of taken on the mantle of climate change, and this is sort of the, the bad guys in films like um, James Bond or Doctor Who are increasingly linked to climate change. So Thanos, although Thanos being the bad guy, wanted to come down and get rid of half the population of the world because they were destroying the planet, it's very difficult to sort of then say, well, actually, maybe he was bad um, because actually he wanted to lower everyone's carbon footprint, but his solution to that was to kill everyone. Um, but the bad guys in James Bond are increasingly environmental villains. Doctor Who, they're environmental and climate change villains. Uh, if people have seen Utopia on Channel 4, that's a very dystopian vision of how to solve climate change uh, and environmental problems. But there, there are some great speeches about climate change by the villains in these films as well. So we all need to live within our carbon footprints um, and, and manage that individually, but we need to be supported in that by governments. So, um, and uh, community is a really interesting question. Obviously, we're seeing a lot about what's going on in and around Cambridge uh, and pushing that forward. So this sort of local community push uh, and creating those communities where people can share and build on each other's knowledge is really important. But I still think that, you know, in the last 10 years, we've also birthed this global community that was never there before. 
So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, uh, TikTok, which was there as well. All of these things allow us to uh, know what is going on instantly somewhere else in the world. And if that's someone's house is being flooded or burnt because they're in Australia or in India, we see these impacts and we can start to empathize a bit more. However, I think we're just at the, the cusp of this sort of what does that actually mean uh, for understanding um, each other and individuals and what does that mean for this global community? And there's lots of bads that come along with that global community as well. Um, but I think there's just a lot of good which is untapped that we could do a lot more with. But in the next 10 years uh, and beyond, we do need to change the way we work so that we have better work-life balance. And a lot of that has emerged uh, even more um, visibly from COVID uh, and the time that we've spent in lockdown. But a lot of people are, are now reassessing how people work and, and how, what we should be doing around our local families and communities. So how do we put more time and effort into families and communities so it's not just working 60 hours a week or whatever it is um, and then wondering why people go off and exploit the world um, because they're bitter about it and then uh, i suppose finally on uh sort of reflecting on what we want leaders to do uh so what we've done in the last 10 years from a leadership perspective is that children have gone out and uh striked against inaction by our leaders uh, so I would say the leadership firmly sits with the children uh, over the last 10 years. Governments have agreed to a Paris Agreement, but essentially that pledges uh, governments to try and keep temperatures below two degrees without actually saying how we're going to do that. So it's an aspiration to not even set a set of targets for emission reduction, just that we want to keep temperatures below two degrees without knowing whether we can do that, what actually the emissions are. That we need to get to allow that to happen so i think we need the politicians to take over the leadership from the children to start putting in place really ambitious policy uh, that that uh, allows us to deliver against these targets um, like net zero targets or two degree targets that, that frankly don't mean anything unless you actually know what policy is going to change this particular energy plant or the insulation on this house so um You'll be able to see some of these quotes, and I won't go through them all, but here are some of the quotes from the children uh, that uh, wrote to us, um, and they, were, they covered a huge range of different issues, from just asking politicians to say, why aren't we all driving electric cars, why aren't we all using our bikes a lot more, and some children just saying, actually thinking about it, I will cycle to school. Um, so even just in that small engagement of writing a letter, you can see some action and, and some of the children engaging a little bit more and understanding what's going on to the slightly more um, researched uh, children like Freya in the UK, who wants a house made of microbes to generate eco-friendly electricity and the concrete holding them together with bacteria in it, making the concrete heal itself uh, using some sort of chemical process. So her letter was incredibly detailed. Uh, about very particular technology solutions and things that should be put into buildings. All of it well researched, all of it already being trialed. And to some of them, we, we need to test these out in the market. Uh, to some quite depressing letters, especially from uh, India, where villages are already seeing um, water shortage, droughts. Uh, so we had some letters from children saying, you know, our, our uh, village used to grow rice, we can't grow rice. We're now seeing fights with our neighboring village over the water source um, so people are being uh, impacted and they can see their parents worrying about the actual uh, impact that they have uh, on the day to day so just finally um i thought i'd just sort of touch on cop again it's so obviously in uh cop 26 in glasgow this is where we want to hand over to global leaders uh, and this is just a, a plot of the number of people who go to these events um, so uh, this is the sort of number of participants up until 2014. So I couldn't find a more recent one, um, but it, it sort of plateaus and it, it's, it's a huge endeavor. And obviously Glasgow is going to be probably smaller because of COVID restrictions, um, but otherwise it would have been this uh, place with tens of thousands of people gathering, both the, the sort of formal delegates 
uh, the negotiators, but also the NGOs, uh, the school children, uh, the uh, businesses, uh, all around trying to lobby, trying to influence. Uh, and you kind of think, well, back in the early stages where it was just the people who had to make decisions meeting, maybe that was better in, in a certain way. It was really difficult to get anything done in a COP. Most decisions have been made before, and then you do get ministers turning up to try and finalise the, the, the last minute details. But um, they're just there's just this huge endeavour with a massive carbon footprint, of course. So um, there's a lot of committed people and there's a lot of um, uh, people with interests to make sure something happens. Uh, so it's really, I mean, it's, it's just this massive industry around cops as well, uh, which is really interesting. So we'll, we'll look to see uh, whether the UK government can get uh, others to commit to something ambitious coming out of COP. Uh, we hope they do. Um, so that's it. I'll stop sharing my screen and then I can have a look at the chat or if anyone's got any questions or, or things they wanted to add as well. Um, that would be fine. Thank you, Alad. So um, does anybody have any questions? Um, so put them in the chat. Yeah, and I've got one from Jenny, which she wanted me to read out. So shall I do that? Yep. So, um, Ala, Jenny uh, said uh, most government targets are looking at a linear scaling of renewables and linear reduction in carbon released to reach net zero. To stop triggering lots of climate tipping points, we need to rapidly decrease carbon emissions as soon as possible. How can we get this message across to governments and the general public? Thank you. Uh, it's true. I mean, I think the they're not always i mean they're, they're sort of not always linear some of them are initial exponential decreases some of them actually have a much shallower initial decrease and then a much steeper decrease later on depending on which government trajectory you're looking at uh, so the average is is roughly linear but some are much deeper earlier some are much deeper later on the much deeper later on are much worse obviously because you've got a lot of carbon uh, in between um to a certain extent and we're doing quite a lot of work around innovation to a certain extent as if you it, i don't know if it really matters certainly for the public it doesn't matter as much for governments what we need them to put in place is a really solid set of policies that enable the change to happen and what we've seen is as soon as you get cost curve kicking in and innovation starting to happen that is then exponential and you can't slow it down so it when we've talked to governments, it's almost easy to say, look, it can be linear. You don't understand how innovation works. You don't understand how business works. You don't understand how people change really quickly. And if you get them started on that trajectory, which they're comfortable with, it's much easier to then really ramp it up. At the moment, they're really worried about even starting on any trajectory still. Um, but as soon as you saw, you know, you put in a feed-in tariff, then it went from zero to 4,000% uh yeah the four thousand fold increase in some places in the uk for solar power installations within three months and the projections for that were linear what you need to make sure is that governments can respond and then they don't slow it down because they go actually that's just too quick so we need to make sure that governments can can keep up with the rapid change but i think the, the change will be much quicker as long as we start it so mm. I'm, I'm less concerned about the Trajectory. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, J John Preston, I don't know. You, you're welcome to come in and, and uh, mention some of your comments. You, you had a comment there, which I think follows nicely from what Alad was saying about the the difficulty of capacity and training in the construction industry. Are you there, John? Yes, I am. I am indeed. I've had long-standing battles with this because basically, for the last fifty years, the industry has been training for work on new buildings. We haven't got the capacity to repair and make the most of our existing buildings and particularly for tr traditional buildings which are up to 35 percent of the stock there isn't the skill base or the capacity to repair them first of all which optimizes performance or even to do appropriate retrofit so that's a, a very basic skills issue and the problem is that over the past 10 years the construction industry has moved very little there was a conference i was involved in 10 years ago when the government's chief construction advisor Paul Burrell 
uh, Paul Morell tackled these issues and said, you know, we've got to do X, Y, and Z. But of course, given government's approach, the last thing they want to do is regulate. And that has always been the difficulty is how you actually get big bodies to turn around and achieve the extent of change in the short time required. Alan? Yeah, actually, I, um, I, I try and I'm, I'm usually very pessimistic in the presentations, but trying to be a bit more optimistic in this one, but uh, I'd, I'd actually probably say it's even worse than you said, because while we're training on the skills base, while we're training people for new build, we're training people for the wrong sort of new build in the main. So we've got the wrong sort of new build expertise and uh, we've got the, oh, yeah, and we don't have the skills for retrofitting. We, I mean, we do have an employment, unemployment problem. So we have the right people, um, but the construction industry in the UK, it's just, I don't know, it, it is, broken uh, and the construction industry elsewhere is less broken so maybe we do need to think about importing some of those skills or ways of doing it and we, we do need a radical change in the way construction works in the UK not least for skills uh, but if it was if it was innovative and you could see houses being built that were different and new I think that would attract people into the sector the problem is we're not attracting people into the sector currently but yeah that, so that is I'm hopeful you can do it in 10 years, but I agree nothing's really changed on the skills side over the last, well, 50 years at least. Well, can, can I just say the CITB, the Construction Industry Training Board, has produced a Skills for Net Zero paper last year, which hopefully sets out the way forward, but the problem is actually getting the training capacity in place to achieve change on the scale needed within the time scale needed. And I've been in a number of sessions recently discussing these issues. And you really start to wonder whether in fact behavior change is gonna to have to come up the list in relation to how we use our buildings. Because there simply won't be time to achieve the changes to the buildings on the scale we need to meet the government targets. Yeah. Alan, do you wanna come back on that about the idea of behavior change and reducing consumption side stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, well, that's always a, a difficult one, how you incentivize, how you work with people. But again, sometimes, I mean, it's understanding how you unlock the behavior change, whether that's in homes or whether that's around food is, is really difficult. Nobody, I mean, nobody has a formula that knows that, you know, if you did this government policy, if you launched a green deal, everyone would insulate their homes. That's what government believed. Uh, obviously, that was a badly designed policy. Um, but, uh, you know, and then the plant based diet, nobody planned that. No, it wasn't a policy driven thing. Something happened, and then suddenly plant based diet was the thing to do. So, whereas everyone has been saying, you know, fair trade and changing diets, it was always going to be a four to five percent of the market at most. So I think we need to get much better at understanding actually what creates those really big behavior changes that have happened and then see if we can seed them in the future. But, and, and it can happen really quickly. Uh, avoided tax is always a brilliant way of doing it. So, you know, the way that London changed its transport was to introduce a congestion charge, not because uh, that necessarily um, does anything in terms of political or ideology, it's just because people don't like paying tax. So it's a, it's a tax you can avoid by not driving. Uh, plastic bag tax. People were, you know, people can afford 5p for a plastic bag in the main, but they just don't want to pay it. So a, a small amount of something that looks like a tax tends to have a massive disproportionate impact on behaviour. So maybe we should have congestion charge for Cambridge and then invest that back into public transport. You need the alternatives, obviously, with London with an underground, it's easier to do it there. But yeah. And I think Isabella, you made a point in the chat about transport. I wonder if that links into what we were saying. Are you there? Yes, yes, I can I can ask my question. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Alad, for, for the presentation. It was really nice to see the key points coming out and, and the challenges, but also positive things of the transition. That is really nice. Um, my comment is related to the role um, uh, the electric vehicles might have in the transition to net zero. A couple of years ago at CNC uh, with, with 
uh, my colleagues, uh, Tony Eva and Abhi Shiva Kumar, we did a modeling exercise to look at how Cambridge Cambridgeshire transport emissions will look by 2050 if all the cars are um, uh, managed to, to be swapped to electric cars, all the personal cars. And what we found out is that that would reduce about half of the current emissions while still being left with the other half still hanging up there. And, and then we further realized actually the number of cars on the road is a problem to increasing the cycling in the city. So the space, the shared space, these cars take, personal cars take on the roads. So I wonder what is your opinion on, on this decarbonization of, of transport? Um, is it electric vehicles, the, the, the key focus, or, or it's again, we are going back to behavior and, and, and structural changes on how we do it? Uh, so it's both. And roughly, uh, it's electric vehicles if you're rural uh, and you need to travel out to your village to go to the local shop or anything like that. Or for deliveries, then electric trucks and all of that is great. If you're living in Cambridge, um, there's not really any reason to be getting in your car at all. And there's no real reason to have a car parking space outside of your house. So if you took all of the cars out of Cambridge and put to buses and bikes uh, with some uh, ability for disability or carer access or whatever the actual need is um, then you need kind of both so for within that really dense urban spaces then we need to be much bolder on changing our transport plan uh, but for the slightly wider journeys people will need to make some journeys where you just can't get buses or you can't get or you can't cycle that far so then you do need electric vehicles so you need the electric vehicle infrastructure but you also need public transport and cycling infrastructure in place and you can't do it without disrupting the car journeys and unfortunately we do seem to be reluctant to disrupt car journeys thanks alad and can i come back to you did you want to um were we were we wrapping up the formal part of the meeting now how are we doing it I think you're on mute there, Anne. Cheers, thanks. Um, yeah, um, we will wrap up the formal part of the, of the, of the um, session um, at two, um, and then people are welcome to stay if they if they wish and are able to until uh, you know up to up to two thirty just for an informal chat. But um, I assume that Alid um, may have may have work to do. <laughs> yeah, I can stay for another ten minutes, but then I do need to go. Okay. Well, that's great because there's a few more questions for you. So that's <laughs> excellent. Was there anything you wanted to do before too, though, Anne? Um, well, I was just going to say, um, maybe we just have a little intermission for AOB. Um, normally, at the meeting, we have just a little session where people can share anything they want to share with, with other people. Um, so are there any events coming up that you would like to tell people about um, or um, anything relevant to the, um, to the issue? And do put it in chat if you've if you've got anything. Otherwise, we'll just carry on. And can I just say I put something in chat a while ago, which is a joint conference with the Sustainable Traditional Buildings Alliance, which I'm involved with, and the SBAB, which is looking very much at retrofit and traditional buildings. A two day or two morning sessions next week, but that's in the chat already. Okay, thanks, John. So do look look back on the chat for that if anybody's interested. Has anybody got anything else they'd like to tell people about or share? Um, the, um, it's the Big Green um, Week uh, as part of the Climate Coalition. Um, and um, so there's a lot of interesting events happening this week in particular. Um, so do go, do go and have a look on the Climate Coalition uh, website of the Big Green Week um, to see other things. Um, and of course, um, I see here from, from Tom, um, there's the Open Eco Homes really inspiring um, series of events which are happening yeah, right now. I think so, there's one tomorrow um, over the next few weeks where you can tour people's individual homes um, online um, and be inspired. They're very, very inspiring and interesting. Okay, so lots of things, things coming up. Yeah, so it's great to see the stuff coming into the, um, the chat with events. So, so keep having a look at that. Should we go back to a few more questions, Anne? Yeah, yeah I, think that, I think that's good. If you've got anything else um, that you want to share, put it in chat and we will resume with Alid. Thank you. Thanks, Alid. Um, uh, Alid, uh, Andrew Bird, are you there? Because you've put a question there. I don't know if you're still here. Um, 
Otherwise I can read it out. I can't see on my thing. He's still here. Hello. Yeah, Andrew. Oh, yeah, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I was just, I work in West Africa and uh, it, I, I've just sort of come in on this uh, chat because I saw it advertised on Twitter. And um, we just have vast, vast areas of, 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 uh, of land which is uh, deforested and depleted. And it always doesn't make any sense to me why the UK doesn't just link up with some of these African nations and do a lot of their carbon uh, sequestration on, on those lands. I just wanted to, a quick sort of, I, I understand that the Paris Agreement and everything was uh, allowed countries to do their, their, their sort of carbon stuff in, in, in other places. I just don't understand why we don't do that. I think that's a really good question, Alad. And and just a bit, can you explain a bit what's going on with that sort of finance internationally? What's going on with the, the, the COP agreements? Yeah, so there's, I mean, it's all changing as well. And we'll see what finance agreements come out of uh, COP26. So, I mean, essentially, the governments have agreed to uh, 10 billion a year uh, going between Annex One developed countries in the main to um, developing countries. So it's supposed to be 10 billion a year in finance flowing between the two. Uh, and COP26, the agreement should go up to 100 billion a year. And actually, it should already be 100 billion a year, according to Paris, but it's not. Um, so they hope to cement a, a step change in finance. A lot of that finance is more towards adaptation. Uh, or traditionally it's gone in towards adaptation, whether that's flood defences or infrastructure or something like that. There are then lots of different mechanisms around carbon pricing where countries have been allowed to offset their emissions by doing things like uh, investing in forests uh, and stopping deforestation or planting trees in other countries. Uh, so, you know, Norway government uh, is partnered in, with Guyana where they are... Um, paying to stop the deforestation or the rate of deforestation there. So they're, they're putting in uh, billions of dollars to pay for alternatives to the logging. Um, there's also, a, a but, uh, and you know we're part of this, there's a massive criticism of that, which is basically Norway can pay a country in Latin America, in that case, uh, or a country in Africa to plant some trees and carry on polluting everywhere else. And even the you know, finance ministers that we spoke to in Norway say it's just, just conscious offsetting. We can just carry on doing all the bad things and, and uh, hope someone else will plant some trees. Um, so ideally, we're not offsetting what we're doing by doing something in Africa or Latin America. However, there needs to be a financial market so that we're also not exploiting uh, land in Latin America or in Africa for, especially for food that we're growing, so that we are, um, so that we're not encouraging deforestation, but also if there is an economic imperative that we can compensate for that economic imperative so that we can take the burden of protecting ecosystems around the world uh, so that we can, we, you know, so we can do that. So, uh, but the UK government is doing quite a bit of that already. Uh, it needs to do a lot more, but it's one of the biggest climate donors compared to other countries, but it should be doing a lot more. So there is a lot of funding going into deforestation and reforestation in Latin America and in um, Africa, but it's mostly around the iconic rainforests. Uh, so it's around the Amazon, and so rather than smaller areas, uh, and we should also be doing a lot of planting trees in the, in our own country as well. So uh, I'd expect to see a lot more here. The only the only one thing I would say is that the UK government would would probably jump on this straight away. People criticise them for offsetting. They also criticise them for colonisation. So the, the problem with doing anything like this is that it, it is up to the individual sovereign nations to come up with their national plans. And if their national plans don't include forestation, then um, it is difficult for you know, former colonial powers to go in and say, actually, we want to pay you to do this. So there is that politics that also plays into it. So it, you know, it's political but it, it needs to change. Can I ask a quick follow-up to Alad? What's the, what's the role of business? And the one that came into my mind when you were talking was, you know, Ecosia with their tree planting search engine thing. 
And and I'm just wondering, are there examples like that or of other where the, there are sort of private corporate mechanisms rather than government? And if so, how do we separate those from greenwashing and offsetting that seems inappropriate? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so as a broad brush, all of that is greenwashing. Um, and I kind of ignore it all. There are some, um, you know, unless you're in the business of paper mills and sustainable forest management, then anything that looks like tree printing is, is often greenwashing to, to, to distract from the core business. So there are some businesses that have a huge impact on land and they should be focusing on <clears throat> forestation and ecosystems management. Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of companies do do offsetting schemes there are some increasing amount of focus on the NGO side to make sure, like the Woodland Trust, to make sure that when companies do do offsetting, especially air transport, and people can still travel abroad as often as you want, as long as you offset, and then you've got a net zero flight. Um, the problem with the, with the historic schemes there is that they've planted trees and they've not managed the trees going forward. So there are now increasing NGOs who are getting involved in let's actually make sure you know the offsetting that is provided is a real offset um so that the trees are still there in 20 30 years and the carbon is actually captured and they haven't just been planted and left to die so there's it's an important to look at who they're partnered with <clears throat> whether they're partnered with anyone and whether the trees that they've already planted are still alive uh, and if they're transparent about that um but even then it's still offsetting which i don't like and, and so the, it's more about governments doing this. And, and apart from that, you, you said about the industries that affect land use, like food industries and that, you know, food production and that sort of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you know, but British Airways going in and, and paying uh, places in Africa to reforest. I, I think it's it's not um, it's not what British Airways are supposed to be doing. It should be up to governments and the communities to be doing it. It's, it, it's sort of, you know, you have to question the motives of an airline, why, why they're doing mm. that is, is to distract you from asking the difficult questions of them. So I, I know you've got to go in a moment or two, Alad. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts on, on what a small organisation like Carbon Neutral Cambridge should be looking at doing? You know, what's like any, any thoughts on the role of a little organisation in a, little city in one country of the world, given the global scale of this. Uh, yeah, I think we've had uh, lots of discussions about this in the past. And I don't know, I mean, I think Cambridge in particular, it would probably be a different answer elsewhere, but I think Cambridge in particular um, is a really interesting city because everyone knows where it is. So it, is, it has a global reputation. Uh, it is the home of lots of innovation and change. And I think we do, as a city, need to be as bold as possible. We, we should be, uh, you know, the, the carbon zero city of the world. There's no reason why we shouldn't be. We've got all the technology, we've got all the brain power, we've got the people that can do it. And, and we should be a little bit more robust in challenging our uh, city council, our local authorities. We've got a climate commission that's kind of saying something and maybe they could be bolder in saying, actually, we should be world leading in this. Um, so I think that's what you know, CNC can be still shouting, saying we should be world leading in this. Uh, there's no reason why we can't be at the front rather than trying to catch up with Hull or uh, Leeds. <laughs>